Whatever the UFO phenomena really is, it has been part of our story since early history. The phenomena is global, and even though most of these people have never met, their stories can sound the same. In this UFO history series, you will learn the essentials of each case as we travel around the world and through time. In episode number one, we start with antiquity and go through to the year 1900, just before man invents the airplane and takes to the skies. Although there are some intriguing cave paintings, our earliest recording of what may have been a UFO starts in 1450 BC. It's 1450 BC and we're at the Gebel Barkal outcropping in southern Egypt, specifically the Temple of Amun. After conquering the ancient Nubian city of Napata, Tutmos III had a stele erected at the Temple of Amun, beneath the cobra-shaped Gebel Barkal outcropping. The stele described how a star came down to set fire to Tutmos's adversaries. It's the year 218 BC, and we're in Rome. During the build-up to the Second Punic War, Titus Livy recorded prodigies in the winter sky, including Navium Specium de Caiolo Aldu Fusisi. Phantom ships had been seen gleaming in the sky. It's 217 BC, and we're in the ancient Roman town of Arpi. Parmas, or metal shields, were seen in the sky. It's the year 212 BC, and we're in the town of Riate, Italy. It was reported that a huge stone was seen flying about in the sky. It's the year 173 BC and we're in Lanuvium, Italy. It was said that a great fleet was seen in the sky. It's 154 BC, and we're in Compsa, Italy. It is also reported here that shields, or arma, were flying about in the sky. In 104 BC, the people of Ameria and Tudor noticed weapons in the sky rushing together from the east to the west, with those in the west being vanquished. It's the year 100 BC, and we're in Rome. A round shield, flying and emitting sparks, was seen flying in the sky. It's 43 BC, and we're still in Rome. A spectacle of defensive and offensive weapons were reported to have risen from the ground to the sky with a clashing noise. It's 7 AD in the ancient Roman Republic of Frisia, what is today modern Turkey. 
According to Plutarch, a Roman army commanded by Lucullus was about to begin a battle with Mithridates VI of Pontus when the sky burst asunder and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. Plutarch reports the shape of the object as like a wine jar. It's springtime in the year 65 AD, and we're in Judea. The historian Josephus reports, On the 21st of the month Artemisium, there appeared a miraculous phenomena passing belief. Indeed, what I'm about to relate would, I imagine, have been deemed a fable, were it not for the narratives of eyewitnesses and the subsequent calamities which deserve to be so signalized. For before sunset throughout all parts of the country, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing the cities. It's 150 AD in Capua, Italy. On a sunny day, a beast like a piece of pottery, about 100 feet in size, multicolored on top and shooting out fiery rays, landed in a dust cloud accompanied by a maiden clad in white. It's the year 196, and we're back in Rome again. Historian Cassius Dio wrote, A fine rain resembling silver descended from a clear sky upon the forum of Augustus. I did not, it is true, see it as it was falling, but noticed it after it had fallen. And by means of it, I plated some bronze coins with silver. They retained the same appearance for three days, but by the fourth day, all the substance rubbed on them had disappeared. It's the year 285, and we're in the Fayum Desert in Egypt. St. Anthony saw a large silver disc on the desert floor that vanished like smoke. It's the year 748 in Clanmacnoise, Ireland. Three ships were seen voyaging in the air over an assembly for the Teltine Games during the reign of King Domnall. It was reported that their crews were visible in the windows. A man on the airship was said to have cast a spear at a fish down in the water, but missed. He then climbed down on a rope to get his spear as if he was swimming underwater. April 14th, 1561, Nuremberg, Bavaria. Residents of Nuremberg described an aerial battle, followed by the appearance of a large black triangular object, and then a crash outside of the city. A broadsheet recorded that witnesses observed hundreds of spheres, cylinders, and other odd-shaped objects that moved erratically overhead. August 7, 1566, Basel, Switzerland. There are reports of spherical objects coming out of the sun. September 22, 1609, Joseon, Korea. Multiple witnesses reported seeing UFOs in Gosiong, Wanju Gangnyung, Chongcheong County, and Yangyang County. They described a halo or washbowl that was divided in two.
March 1st, 1639, Boston, Massachusetts. It is reported by John Winthrop that one James Everell, a sober, discreet man, and two others, saw a great light in the night at Muddy River. When it stood still, it flamed up and was about three yards square. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. It ran swift as an arrow towards Charleston and up and down about two or three hours. The three men had traveled with the tide in a small barge about a mile, and when it was over, they found themselves carried several miles back against the tide to the place they came from. They had no memory of how this happened. Several other persons saw the same lights that day. April 1665, Stralsund, Germany. Six fishermen who are fishing for herring off the coast of Stralsund watch on as great flocks of birds in the sky morph into warships and engage in a thunderous air battle. The decks teem with ghostly figures when at dusk a flat round shape like a plate appears above the St. Nicholas Church. They flee. The following day they find that they are trembling all over and complain of pain. It's midnight on November 1st, 1685, and we're in the highlands of Scotland. John Nisbet and four men were traveling on a moonless night. Suddenly the clouds opened up and a bright light emerged that was as bright as that of the sun at noonday. But notices that it was much more pleasant, amazing, and astonishing. The light continued for about two minutes, made a noise, and was gone. February 22, 1803, Hitachi Province, Japan. Fishermen on the Harayadori coast of Hitachi Province saw a strange vessel drifting in the sea. They towed the vessel to land and discovered that it was 11 feet high and 18 feet wide. Its shape reminded them of a kohaku, an incense burner. Its upper part appeared to be made of red lacquered rosewood, while the lower part was covered with metal plates. The upper part had several windows made of glass or crystal, covered with bars and clogged with some kind of tree resin. The shape of the hollow boat resembled a wooden rice pot. The windows were completely transparent and the baffled fishermen looked inside. The inner side of the Utsuro Brune was decorated with texts written in an unknown language. Oddly enough, one of the symbols inside the vessel resembled South Korea's current flag. The fishermen found items inside, such as two bed sheets, a bottle filled with 3.6 liters of water, some cake, and kneaded meat. Then the fishermen saw a young woman, possibly 18 or 20 years old. Her body size was said to be about 5 feet. The woman had red hair and eyebrows, the hair elongated by artificial white extensions. The extensions could have been made of white fur or thin white powdered textile streaks. This hairstyle cannot be found in any literature. The skin of the lady was a very pale pink color. She wore long and smooth clothes of unknown fabrics. The woman began speaking, but no one understood her. She did not seem to understand the fisherman either, so no one could ask her about her origin. Although the mysterious woman appeared friendly and courteous, she acted oddly, for she always clutched a quadratic box made of pale material and around 24 inches in size. The woman did not allow anyone to touch the box, no matter how kindly or pressingly the witnesses asked. An old man from the village theorized, this woman could be a princess of a foreign realm who married in her homeland, but when she had an affair with a townsman after marriage, it caused a scandal and her lover was killed for punishment. The princess was banned from home for she enjoyed lots of sympathy, so she escaped the death penalty. Instead, she might have been exposed in that Utsuro Bune to leave to her destiny. If this should be correct, the quadratic box may contain the head of the woman's deceased lover. In the past, a very similar object with a woman was washed ashore on a close-by beach. During this incident, a small board with a pinned head was found. The content of the box could therefore be the same, which would certainly explain why she protects it so much. It would cost lots of money and time to investigate the woman in her boat. Since it seems to be tradition to expose those boats at sea, the townspeople thought they should bring the woman back to the Utsurobune and let her drift away. The 
It's winter of 1835, Koishikawa Gardens, Japan. A UFO is spotted over the gardens, one of many spotted in the area during those times. August 12, 1883, Zacatecas, Mexico. Jose Bonilla was elected to be the first director of the new telescope at the Astronomical Observatory in the state of Zacatecas, Mexico. Jose Bonilla was preparing his telescope for a study when he noticed that objects seemed to be partially blocking the sun. Intrigued, Bonilla spent the next 48 hours using a process known as collodion process to capture 447 ink photographs of the objects. Along with his photographs, Bonilla also left descriptions of what he noticed to clarify what the low-quality ink images were showing, as well as a significant amount of data. Bonilla described the objects as fuzzy or misty in nature and often referred to the objects that had dark tails. January 17, 1896, San Francisco, California. On November 18, 1896, the Sacramento Bee and the San Francisco Call reported the first sighting, which had taken place the night before. Witnesses reported a light moving slowly over Sacramento on the evening of November 17 at an estimated 1,000 foot elevation. Some witnesses said they could see a dark shape behind the light. A witness named R. L. Lowry reported that he had heard a voice from the craft issuing commands to increase elevation in order to avoid hitting a church steeple. Lowry added, in what was no doubt meant as a wink to the reader, that he believed the apparent captain to be referring to the tower of a local brewery, as there were no churches nearby. Lowry further described the craft as being powered by two men exerting themselves on bicycle pedals. Above the pedaling men seemed to be a passenger compartment, which lay under the main body of the dirigible. A light was mounted to the front end of the airship. Some witnesses reported the sound of singing as the craft passed overhead. November 18, 1896, Lodi, California. The November 19, 1896 edition of the Stockton, California Daily Mail featured one of the earliest accounts of an alleged alien craft sighting. Colonel H.G. Shaw claimed that while driving his buggy through the countryside of Lodi near Stockton, he came across what appeared to be a landed spacecraft. Shaw described it as having a metallic surface which was completely featureless apart from a rudder and pointed ends. He estimated it at a diameter of 25 feet and said the vessel was around 150 feet in total length. Three slender, seven-foot-tall, apparent extraterrestrials were said to approach from the craft while emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy and then tried to physically force him to accompany them back to the airship. The aliens were said to give up after realizing they lacked the physical strength to force Shaw aboard. They supposedly fled back to their ship, which lifted off the ground and sped out of sight. Shaw believed that the beings were Martians sent to kidnap an earthling for unknowable but potentially nefarious purposes. April 17, 1897, Aurora, Texas. On April 19, 1897, an article in the Dallas Morning News written by S.C. Hayden described the UFO crash. The UFO is said to have hit a windmill on the property of a judge, J.S. Proctor, two days earlier at around 6 a.m. local central time. The pilot of the crashed craft, who was reported to be not of this world and a Martian, according to Army Signal Service officer named T.J. Weems, from nearby Fort Worth, did not survive the crash and was buried with Christian rites at the nearby Aurora Cemetery. The cemetery contains a Texas Historical Commission marker commemorating the incident. Reportedly, wreckage from the crash site was dumped into a nearby well located under the damaged windmill while some ended up with the alien in the grave. Adding to the mystery was the story of Mr. Brawley Oates, 
who purchased Judge Proctor's property around 1935. Oates cleaned out the debris from the well in order to use it as a water source, but later developed an extremely severe case of arthritis, which he claimed to be the result of the contaminated water from the wreckage dumped into the well. As a result, Oates sealed up the well with a concrete slab and placed an outbuilding atop the slab. According to writing on the slab, this was done in 1945. Local sheriffs escorted us off the site. It seems they're old hands at this job, but they know that there may be some truth behind the local folklore. There was an alien ship that, you know, that crashed here, and they found this, uh, the alien, and the uh, citizens picked up this creature and tried to nurse the creature and, put, and hid the creature in a barn, in one of the barns that was here. And when they, uh, uh, the alien died, well, they you know, buried the uh, creature in this in this cemetery. Back in the 20s, some people heard the story and came out and was trying to dig up the cemetery. And they had, you know, got our, the local folks got their shotguns out and, and you know, fared off the intruders. That message is still clear today: no trespassing. But those restrictions haven't discouraged researchers from the Mutual UFO Network from piecing together the story. It began with a series of strange encounters in 1896 and 1897. Well, the month of April 1897, people were reporting what we call mysterious airships, for the lack of a better name, uh, all over the Midwest. From would Michigan. We call them UFOs now? We would call them UFOs now, yes. But this particular encounter was different from the others. One of these airships allegedly crashed into a large wooden windlass or windmill. That was the beginning. Charlie Stevens saw this object coming in at 4 a.m. in the morning and it came up and hit the windlass and destroyed it and what Charlie Stevens was seeing from about three miles away down the area. Uh, it flamed up, uh, it exploded, and he could see the flames from that distance. Today, the story still lives on with Bonnie Oates. He got in 20 foot of this old uh, well house out here, and he said, now right in here is where it happened. I said, well, that's where the well is. He said, there's a lot of twisted metal. In a more sophisticated place or time, this bizarre incident might have attracted more attention. But this was an isolated farming community, and the commotion quickly died. It would be the logical thing to do is to, well, let's clean up the mess, let's bury the thing and go on about our business. Not even realizing the value or the importance scientifically to the find that they had. What did they find? Based on eyewitness accounts, investigator Hayden Hughes managed to create these composites of the ship's dead pilot. Most of the smashed ship was carted off as souvenirs and at least one metal chunk was buried with the pilot but a few pieces were tossed down a well near the crash. That might account for the grotesque ailment suffered by Bonnie Oates' husband, Brawley, who later died. And what did he blame that on? Radiation that got into the well water where the crash occurred in 1897. Bonnie, what did your husband believe? Well, he thought there was something somewhere he didn't know what. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to make sure that you don't miss an episode.